Hi, um, as Dr. Kakana said, I'm Beatrice uh, Maldonado, I'm an assistant professor of economics and international studies here at the College of Charleston. Um, and I'm uh, joined by these lovely ladies, which I'm going to actually let them introduce themselves as part of the sort of Q&A. We're going to have just a conversation about how we got to where we are today um, and hopefully give you an idea of what it's like to, you know, be an economist that, you know, and how, what, what it would look like if you were interested, both as a female or a male or, you know, um, just in case, um, what kinds of things that, are, that, we, that we saw ourselves in the field as we were going through various stages of, the, of training and publishing and careers and whatnot. So, uh, so with that, I'm going to ask you guys to uh, maybe go in a row and tell us who you are and where you are right now. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amy Willis. Um, I've gotten to meet some of you over the last few days, and it's been super. Uh, thanks for having me here at the College of Charleston. Um, I work for a, an educational foundation called the Liberty Fund, which is located in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, it's a foundation. It's, uh, it's an academic foundation. It's not a think tank. We don't engage in any policy work. Um, what we do is actually similar to the mission of uh, Dr. Caltano Center, is try to focus on what the ideal of a society of free and responsible individuals would look like. And we do that via a publishing program, uh, via a conference program. We run all of our conferences Socratic style. Uh, so conferences are small groups of individuals who come together over a common set of texts and with the, uh, with the objective of conversation, the only one in mind. Um, and we have a, a variety of web platforms, uh, which is what my area of, of work is. So we host a number of websites. Um, probably most appropriate uh, to those interested in Adam Smith Week uh, are EconLib, which is short for the Library of Economics and Liberty, and naturally Adam Smith Works, which is actually our newest uh, website uh, and has uh, a blog feature. It has original essays by scholars on Smithian related topics. Um, and uh, there are a growing number of educational resources. Um, this is one of the things that, that I'm really excited to work on. So we have lesson plans. Uh, for middle school, high school, and college level instructors. We have a reading guide uh, for the theory of moral sentiments. So if you want to do a sort of deep dive into that interesting text, hopefully we can give you some help. Um, the Wealth of Nations one is uh, in process and coming out soon. Uh, my background, I've had all sorts of jobs. Um, I joked with students at the student colloquium the other day that I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up, uh, because I aspire not to grow up, partly, but um, there's just always so many new and interesting things to do. So when I came to Liberty Fund, I worked in this conference program, uh, putting on largely economics conferences. Uh, my personal interests are in K-12 education uh, and Adam Smith, uh, perhaps obviously for those of you who have met me. Um, but before coming to Liberty Fund, I did a number of things. Um, I've been everything from a, a locker room attendant to a bartender uh, to a retailer. Uh, I taught high school for 10 years, uh, teaching economics. Um, I've taught community college, I've taught university. Uh, I ran a nonprofit that focused on professional development for teachers. And then I came to Liberty Fund. I've been there about 14 years now. Um, and I've done different things at Liberty Fund sort of throughout my tenure there. So I don't like to get bored and I don't like to sit still, I think is, <laughs> is the, the theme of my career thus far. Um, I'm Jamie Lemke. I work at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, so um, it's been, uh, we can talk you know, more about background later in the panel if people are interested and want, but basically I'm a former music student who decided that I would take a chance on getting a PhD in economics, um, and now I teach um, master's level classes at George Mason University in their economics program. Um, I'm serving on some dissertation committees. Actually, my first dissertation student is completing his PhD this year, so I'm like the proudest mama bear who ever lived. <laughs> um, and uh, I also write. So I write a lot on women's economic rights in American history, um, but I've also studied pretty extensively uh, the methodology of economics and of studying institutions. So trying to look at societies as kind of comprised of rule systems and um, culture and politics and economics being very much integrated. Um, so it's been fantastic. You know, I was the kind of kid who, um, fun for me was like sitting on my bedroom floor with a book all day long. So if you, you know, feel that way about about books and about you know words and ideas, then um, academics is a fantastic career. So the fact that I get to spend uh, you know a part of every day reading and writing is just 
fabulous. Um, but yeah, so that's that's the short of what I do. I'm Maria P. Paganelli. Uh, I'm a professor of economics at Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas. Um, I've been in the Trinity for 10 years. Uh, before, I was working in the economics department at Yeshiva University in New York. Um, I was also interested in reading books uh, as, I, as I was growing up. Um, I got through to economics through political science and international relations. Um, I wanted actually to have a diplomatic career and I was applying for masters in um, um, international relations. And then I was doing my, uh, finishing my degree in Italy. Um, the degree was on the evolution of the law. <coughs> I stumbled across some economists who were working on the evolution of the law as well as the evolution of money. And so I got interested in economics. Um, and uh, while I was applying for graduate school, somebody mentioned apply also in economics. So um, that's how I ended up in economics. Um, I worked predominantly on Adam Smith, um, mostly because, again, I was interested in the evolution of money. Um, and uh, so I was working on the, um, on the beginning of fiat money, which is the kind of money that we have in our pockets today. And those first examples of fiat money were in the late 18th century or 19th century. So I started to read whomever I could find on money in that period. And Adam Smith was one of them, and I sort of got stuck ever since. So some of you ladies actually answered this. You just answered how you got into economics. <coughs> I really wanted to give you guys the opportunity to also know. I think that's great. Um, how, how the two of you found economics. I mean, I think you guys have different paths. We don't like, necessarily all have linear, like, go straight through economics and study economics and do economics. You know, it's actually, that's actually the exception. Yeah, I mean, I was pretty accidental, too. Um, I never had uh, an economics class in high school. I had several as an undergrad. I thought they were the worst thing that could have possibly happened to a human. Um, so I was not an undergrad econ major. Um, after trying a couple things, it was actually, uh, I signed on to teach high school initially to teach world history and civics, um, which I did a little, but then I got to teach economics because I'd had enough horrific uh, classes in economics uh, to, you know, to know enough to, to sort of teach the class. Um, but I really got the bug then. Um, and decided to, to go on and, and learn more economics from there. But uh, if you had asked me, um, even you know when I was uh, if those of you who were undergrads your age, I'm like, no way. Um, so you're really lucky to have professors here like you do that um, can get you engaged in ideas and you know things things beyond levers of economic machines and numbers and things like that. So yeah, I. I was telling the, some folks who came to dinner last night that I had um, a pretty horrific first economics class as well. It was literally a, a real estate agent who was adjuncting and teaching one um, economics class in the evening, three hours long. I'm sorry if any of you are in three hour long evening classes right now, but whatever demon designed those needs to take them back. Um, but so he would take the, the PowerPoint slides that had come packaged with the textbook and put them up on the projector and then read them. I went to one class and I never showed up again except for the midterm and the final and that was it because I didn't need the professor. But then, I, you know, I, like I mentioned, I was a music student, so I was playing classical piano. Um, I had read a lot, been like a nerdy, booky kid, so I was always interested in kind of these big questions about um, what life is like and what life is for and kind of what are the the meaningful things about being on the planet and, and why is it that some people wind up having such uh, dramatically different lives than other people but I'd always kind of look for answers in philosophy and I would take religious studies classes and I would read a lot of literature I thought you know maybe I'll try to write fiction be that kind of writer um, and then I took a comparative economic systems class and we learned about the differences between the Soviet economic system and a, a capitalist market economy. And just hearing the stories of the way that life was restrained within that Soviet system because of the desire to um, control and manipulate economic production, that just really um, kind of shook me. 
And so then I think it was that moment in time and learning about that, that history and how economics applied in the world. Yep, there are some economists who get really into it because they're like, oh, I saw the supply and demand graph, and it was like the heavens opened up, and the supply and demand graph was oh, glowing, and like that had all the answers. For me, it, you know, the, the, I think all that stuff is fantastic, but it was learning about how it played out in the real world. Um, and so that was the moment in time where I thought, okay, I have to do something with these ideas. I still did not know yet what exactly that was going to be. Um, so I actually wound up working at a, a nonprofit in kind of an education-related uh, field immediately after I finished my undergrad, and I got to know kind of some other people who were working in academic economics, um, and I started the PhD program at GMU. Which, by the way, maybe this is something we can talk about too, is kind of graduate school application. Um, but so the standard advice that a professor like should give you is apply widely and go to the you know the best program that you can get into that has the most funding. That is not what I did, not even close, um, because I knew exactly where I wanted to go. I knew I I knew the program where the research was happening that I wanted to be a part of, and I knew that was George Mason. I wouldn't have wanted to be an economist if I went anywhere else. So you know if you're in that situation, then applying to only one school makes sense, and you know I it worked out for me. I lucked out that I got admitted. If not, I probably would be um, teaching piano lessons right now. I mean, and that would be fine too. Life can go many directions. But, um, but yeah, so that's how I got into economics. I don't know, on your, on your journey to economics? Um, no, I just like don't, don't shut doors. Uh, so I, can, I also, like, I was thinking of the diplomatic career and without applying for a master in economics, being accepted for a PhD even without applying. Um, but the, Letter saying you fit better in our PhD program than our master program, you can upgrade it now, that upgrade. And then I ended up <laughs> with a PhD in economics. When I finished, I didn't know what to do. I mean, I know that I, I like to read, I like to write. I asked my dissertation advisor, what do I do? And he said, like, I don't know. Like, can people, like, what do people do in the private sector? Like, I don't know, I spend all my life in academia. I was like, okay, that doesn't help. <laughs> And so I, I tried to ask around the people that had jobs in the private sector uh, and applied for jobs in academia and ended up in academia. Don't close your doors. <laughs> My story is the boring one. I did an undergrad in economics. I did a master's in economics. So <laughs> mine is the boring one. But I have to say that I I took a high school econ class and thought it was god awful. I don't want to teach them like I read that class. I think there's like a general trend. <laughs> Um, and I think it really does that, that, you know, your first few professors really do make a difference. Um, and then I had to take an econ class for my accounting degree. And I was like, this is, this is actually really interesting, you know, in college. So, you know, you're absolutely right, don't shut doors. Because if I hadn't come back to econ, I'd be completely different. I don't even know what I'd be doing right now. Um, so definitely, you know, get, get past that first econ class. It's sort of a takeaway from this part of the time. Um, try to try a little bit more beyond the first one. So hopefully some of you had a good high school class. I mean, I spent a long time teaching high school. And I like to think it wasn't horrible. <laughs> well, my, my, my econ professor was right. an econ professor. He was a really, you know, he didn't know what he was talking about. In other words, right? So one of my took was a really econ. So, but here you're, you know, you're in college, you know, what you take here is really econ. So go ahead and take some more econ. It's always useful. It's always good. Um, so I have one more question and then we can open it up for anybody else. But um, some of you guys have talked a little bit about research that you do. Sure. Um, I am a little bit off research at the moment um, because what I really love is teaching. Um, and so I've had an opportunity at Liberty Fund in the last several years to focus more on sort of uh, resource development for educators. Um, so I mean, you know, everyone from little people, who some of you know scare me, um, up through college students. Um, so I've been working a lot on, on sort of taking the resources that we make because um, I, perhaps because I spent so much time uh, uh, in a classroom, that just having great texts and having great materials um, isn't necessarily enough to reach the widest audience that we want to reach. So that's been my focus the last few years. Um, and I've been developing a lot of sort of curricular resources and, and classroom resources. Um, but prior to that, um, like I said, my interests are really Smith. 
uh, and, and secondary <coughs> and public choice sort of economics. So I've written stuff on the economics of education, um, a little bit on entrepreneurship. Um, but again, I'm, I'm not, I'm in a very atypical position, right? I'm not uh, in, in, in an academic position at a university, so neither do I have any pressure uh, at the moment to publish or perish or whatever the <laughs> case might be. So I'm lucky. Are there people here who are thinking about careers in academics? So I, I don't want to belabor it too much because I gave a whole talk on my research last night and I, I see some familiar faces kind of from that talk. Um, but I think, you know, the short version is if you're a person who's interested in ideas, maybe what I'll say is even if it's not um, academics formally, there are still a lot of ways to kind of integrate that into your life. Um, some of the programs Amy is working on right now actually are, you know, offering these kind of continuing reading group opportunities for people who are not necessarily at um, a university still. And I don't even, you'll miss this when you're gone, even if it, you know, some of you will at least, even, even if it doesn't <laughs> feel like, feel like it right now. So I think, you know, the opportunity to write, whether, you know, I get to do, um, blogging, I write, you know, academic research articles on women in the market. Um, so I studied the, the history of how industrialization impacted women, and I've also, you know, been able to study things like why does policing go so badly um, in some environments uh, compared to others. Um, so this kind of curiosity, you know, just if it's something that you're not yet considering, but kind of you have the aptitude for, maybe, um, you know, maybe now's a good time to kind of consider it a little bit more seriously. Because I think, you know, one of the things I left out of the story of how I got involved is that the professor that I took that comparative economic systems class with, he sent me an email after I wrote an essay and said, by the way, this is a really good essay, what are you planning on doing after you graduate? Um, and I think, you know, Faculty are are busy and you know don't always catch all of the people who have this great potential. Um, so maybe just like tell that to yourself and see what happens. Um, I think you know this is not something that is exclusive to women, but I think women maybe do a little bit more often um, is kind of underrate their own talents. So like we all know people who overrate their own talents um, and think they're the greatest at everything, but I think also um, a lot of people just assume that a particular career path is off the table for them because it seems fancy or the road seems difficult. Um, but have, you know, how many people have you really talked to who walk down that road? Or, you know, maybe what, even if it's not in academia or related at all, um, maybe just give yourself the opportunity that if there is something that you're um, imagining for the future to kind of reach out and find people who are working in that field. I mean, that's really the only way to learn what it's like and just kind of give yourself that opportunity to expand um, and explore your options. Um, I work on other states. The majority of my work is on Not exclusively, but is always somehow smith so I started with the SMIC of money. Um, I have been working on uh, uh, connecting SMIC with the experimental results. So behavioral economics is one of my side interests. Um, and SMIC helps significantly with understanding the results that come out from the lab. Um, I been, the themes in which I've been working are mostly related to the effects of commerce on morality. Um, not, not exclusively, but that's something I've been working on significantly. Um, I just finished um, a guidebook to the Wealth of Nations, so if you're interested, it's the, um, the Routledge Guidebook to the Wealth of Nations. Um, and right now, um, I am working again on uh, uh, on some something related to money and the money and connection with David Hume as well.
to get back to Jamie's point, uh, being an academic, you get to ask a lot of interesting questions that you're interested in. So my research is a little bit less focused than some of the ladies up here. I, um, generally speaking, I like uh, development, I like political economy, I like where those two meet. That's sort of the nexus of where um, my research is. But I'm interested in things like conflict, in things like climate change, in um, gender and politics. Um, Migration. I mean, I'm kind of a little bit all over the place. Corruption, trade. Um, because we can, right? We're academics. We have the opportunity, you know, given certain, you know, parameters, that we have the opportunity to ask interesting questions that, that or questions that are interesting to us, and find answers to them. Um, and so we are always learning. We're learning from each other. We're learning from our students. We're learning from the research that we do. So I think that's what I think James is trying to say is that you're going to miss being in a place where you get really exposed to the ability to learn all the time. And so don't, you know, just because you graduate doesn't mean that that should be the only you look out for other, for opportunities to do other things, like to your um, local um, civic groups or other types of um, things. Uh, you know, we have something similar here. Uh, it's not, it's not AER, it's the IER, you know. The Boston Society. Society, right? So we have different groups that are out there for the community that are, um, you know, help you You also brought one other good point. I was going to ask you guys, um, uh, you know, as part of what we're doing, as part of you know our academic career, our careers, you know, there are many people that we are that we come across um, in some sort of more influential than others. So, please, want to take a minute to tell us some of your more influential um, figures in your careers. basically for figuring out how it is that communities solve problems on their own without necessarily needing the state to intervene. So she did a lot of her work in cities, talking about local public services. Um, you know, she uh, and her husband um, had spent time in the American West. Um, her husband is from California, and where water is a huge issue. So just getting enough water to continue to be able to, um, like, not just farm, but to, to run the taps in your home sometimes. And particularly in communities, they're often drawing from a, an aquifer that has a limited kind of water source. So, like, how do you resolve this? How do you solve this problem? Um, and, you know, it should be, from the perspective of kind of basic economic game theory, like, impossible. Just an impossible problem to resolve, and everybody's going to wind up thirsty. Um, so she studied how these communities work together and how local organizations would work with um, like the city government and how the different farmers would collaborate with each other. And they took that study on to understanding in other parts of the world, how is it that people who are maybe living um, without a government at all or with only a dysfunctional government <coughs> or who are um, you know, operating uh, kind of within these isolated communities, how they were able to still um, like police problems like um, not overfishing and decimating the fishing population, or you know not completely destroying local resources. Um, but then the really cool thing about her work is that she and her collaborators tied this into a bigger question about democracy and what democracy is capable of. So there's this big issue um, in democratic governance about what is it that a people can solve for themselves and can do for themselves without 
you know, some kind of like magical external third party being able to solve a problem for them. Yeah, you know, like if you really step back and think about it, it gets weird because like who is, there, there are no third parties in the actual world. Because what economists usually mean by that is somebody like completely outside the society who can step in and be like this, you know, magic God's eye kind of arbiter and resolve these problems. But those people don't exist. So when we live in the world of practical politics, we are living in a world where we have to figure out how to solve problems for each other. And so the, all of this resource uh, research that Eleanor Ostrom kind of produced and, and, and drove over a very long academic career, um, it was just so rewarding to see her be acknowledged by the Nobel Prize Committee for that in 2009. Um, and I definitely recommend kind of looking into her work. So that's someone who was influential on me, obviously from a distance. I only was fortunate enough to meet her a couple times um, before she passed away. Um, but uh, just really a, a fantastic woman and an inspiration. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, it, it sort of starts with Smith still, right? I mean, it was through Smith that I um, discovered what I think of as the very human face of economics, right? I mean, even within the Wealth of Nations, uh, all of the examples that he uses and the descriptions, and then I discovered the theory of moral sentiments, which predates uh, the Wealth of Nations, and it sort of opened my eyes to this way of still sort of incorporating uh, economic analysis, but taking humans into account. Um, as I'm really lucky working on online projects as I do, I work with a huge number of economists who challenge me and inspire me every day. So among the people who write for us, uh, who I am including, by the way, Jamie and Maria, um, are other folks uh, like Pete Becky and Brian Kaplan and Pierre Lemieux. Um, Ed Lopez has a new column, uh, and not just uh, economists. Uh, we just put up an article by an English professor named Carolyn Brashears. Uh, where she talks about Adam Smith and sort of the power of stories. Uh, my sort of guide star uh, person with whom I work and who I um, look up to very much as a human and as a scholar is Russ Roberts, uh, who's the host of the Econ Talk podcast series. Um, I look up to him so much because he's a tremendous communicator, for one. I mean, he can take a very complex idea uh, and distill it extremely well so that, you know, my middle school son can generally understand it. Um, but, and he's a fine scholar as well, doing his own work, and he's just a really good person. Um, as far as sort of external influences, um, I totally second Jamie's recommendation for you to look into uh, Ostrom. Uh, obviously, we're all going to say Smith, right? Um, but another scholar who I really look up to and has been sort of this influence from afar is Deirdre McCluskey. Um, she's an economic historian. Um, she has a, a very large trilogy um, that starts with a book called Bourgeois Virtues. Um, and again, it's this sort of human side of economics, right? She looks at what has what have markets done uh, for humanity over the course of history. She calls this the great enrichment, right? The sort of post-industrialization period uh, that Jamie's talking about, sort of how this came about, how it changed lives, right? I mean, it's one thing to sort of measure economic growth and have national income accounts that we can track, but it's it's another thing to talk about how people's uh, manners and morality <coughs> may have improved over time, how arts and culture have improved over time. And all of that is related to economics as well. Um, so again, it's, it's sort of the human face uh, to economics that really um, continues to interest me to this day. Uh, and these are the kinds of things that, that I'm looking at, reading at, and, and again, I'm just lucky to work with such a, an array uh, of people. I forgot a bunch of them, so whoever watches later can holler at me. <laughs> on the material, and the answer was, this is insane. 
you will never be able to do this. Um, it's too broad, you're not going to be able to do it. It's insane that you're even trying. Just find something different, find something smaller. And I left in tears. Uh, because I, it was just the very beginning of my project. And I was told, you can't do it. So I went to my advisor and I said, I was just told that the, this idea is impossible to do. And he was just ignored. You do it. That was like, oh, really? <laughs> and I did it. And something similar, in a sense, happened with my dissertation when I was finishing my PhD. I wanted to work on the evolution of money. And I started to talk to a professor, and this professor told me, it's too broad, it's too big, you're not going to be able to finish it. It's a lifetime project. And I'm like, I work on this particular author, it's just like, um, and I'm like, I don't want to work on the symbol. And he's a great guy, but it's not what I'm interested in. So I went to talk to somebody else who happened to become my dissertation advisor, and I was like, I, I, I received this advice from the person that's supposed to be my dissertation advisor, and he's telling me that I can't do it, but I don't like the idea that he's proposing to me, and this person, uh, this professor, has said, well, just ignore it. Find somebody else to work with. And, and I looked at him, and I'm like, and he's like, you can work with me if you want. And I did my dissertation with him, and I finished it, and I think it turned out well. So to me, those are the people who influenced me the most, uh, are the people who told me, ignore the negativity, ignore the people who tell you you can't do it. You have all the abilities to do it. You have all the capabilities to do it. You have the resources. Just go ahead and ignore the people who said that you can't. So find the professors that allow you to to do what you want to do, and does not that you can't do this. Hard to start. I feel like I would like to mention the, the, the second, the only other female Nobel laureate in economics. Um, she just won this year, um, along with um, uh, two other colleagues of hers. Um, and she's actually um, a person that I, while I don't necessarily do the same kind of research as she does, I do make my development students read a lot of her. Um, and she's uh, super accessible, and so um, it's Esther Duflo. And her and her colleagues won the Nobel Prize for um, the use of randomized controlled trials to answer questions about how to alleviate poverty. Okay, so that was you know, the application of a methodology that we have for a while been using in medicine to social programs, right? To um, validate, to test whether social inter social interventions, interventions like aid funding, works in certain contexts. Because for a long time, we have been throwing money at pro at problems. You know, how to really, how to fight poverty, how to you know how to uh, uh, extend life expectancy, how to cure um, uh, uh, prevent malaria. You know, so like all these questions that we ask in development that are social questions. <coughs> And we just kept throwing money at the problem without really knowing if it was working. And um, so, uh, the kind of methodology that, that her and her colleagues have done allowed us to say something about what the effect of the intervention has actually had on the thing that they were trying to fix, right? Did, did throwing money at the problem here help in comparison to a, a baseline, right? And so they won um, the Nobel Prize for that this year. And she's the first economist, so Ostrom is actually a political scientist. Although, so I, I, I'm not, I, and I, I don't want to take anything away from the political science community, but there is an interesting background story there okay. of the fact that the reason Eleanor Ostrom wound up getting her PhD in political science is that the UCLA Department of Economics is where she wanted to study. The year before she applied was the first time they admitted women, three. They decided those women had not done a good enough job and that this was evidence that women were just not really up to the task of become, becoming economists. So they decided to not admit any further women um, and they denied Eleanor Ostrom. So the political science department at UCLA then invited her in and that's, that's kind of the, the origins of how she wound up becoming an economist. I mean, get, at, getting a, a PhD as a woman in the 1950s was very unusual. 
Um, she actually uh, wound up divorcing her first husband because he did not want her to um, be going on into this career. I mean, it was a conflict with her parents. Her parents, uh, at least at first, thought, like, wasn't secretarial school good enough? Um, why do you have to kind of go and do more? So I think, you know, when we look at um, data points today on um, women's success in not just economics, but STEM fields in general, I think it's easy to forget the fact that um, women have not actually been um, allowed to enter these fields for very, for very long. Um, it, so it took, like if you look at, um, there, there are important exceptions of course, but a lot of uh, women who were um, intellectual contributors in kind of earlier eras, they were often like the wealthy women who, who did not work and they were highly educated and they were able to kind of write on their own and some of those contributions survived. But in terms of being able to, you know, be a woman going into a graduate field and getting the, you know, the highest degree of training and just working in that field, um, it's, it's not a space where women have been that long. So, you know, it, it's going to take a take a while for that pipeline to kind of work through. Um, so, you know, to the extent that there's underrepresentation and um, other, you know, issues like this that are going on in some fields. My view is kind of like just wait because the doors are open now, and and don't let the fact that you hear a news story that says you know you know female uh, you know full professors are it's only thirty five percent of the full professors or things like this don't let that like scare you away and imagine that this is a space that you can't succeed in it just it takes a very long time for this pipeline to work through and academia is changing in the meanwhile so. I mean, I think there are other reasons to not put um, over-reliance on specific statistics like that, but, but in general, kind of don't let those things um, scare you away because we are, not that, we are not that far away from the path breaker that it sometimes feels we are. We are at the um, end of our time. Take an opportunity to thank all of our, um, our